Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rich Sports Talk. I'm joined by AJ Galante. AJ, can't tell you how excited I am to have you today. Now, watch the Netflix documentary, Crimes and Penalties. And I've actually gone on this channel. I said it's probably one of the best sport documentaries I've ever seen. So thank you so much for joining us here today. No, nah, thank you. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate the kind words. Well, I just want to start from the beginning because one thing I loved about this is to talk about your childhood and you getting into hockey. So I want to talk about like, when was the first time you really fell in love with the game? Oh, well, I've, I've said it. I mean, it's, it's, it, it sounds like it's make believe, but I, I remember it was a weekend and uh, I'll never forget. It was early nineties, 93, 94. And uh, you know, it was a rainy weekend. My mom wanted to get us out of the house. So she said, come on, we're going to the movies. And uh you know, we went to the movies. I didn't, you know, know anything about hockey at the time. I didn't know anything about this movie at the time. And we ended up seeing Mighty Ducks. And um, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was the Flying V or something. But something that, you know, the minute the minute that um, that movie was done, I was just uh, I had to get a hockey stick. Um, we ended up getting some rollerblades. And, you know, basically you teach yourself how to skate you know, on the driveway. You know, I, I find it amazing because I have that same parallel with you. And I think The Money Dutch is such an interesting movie because when you ever you talk to people like around our generation, it's like, how'd you get into hockey? I feel like seven out of 10 of them go, when I saw The Money Dutch movie and that's why I wanted to skate, that, that was me too. I saw that movie and I'm like, I want to try hockey. And once you try it, you just, you just get sucked in. It's just so fun. Hockey is one of those games I tell people when I played all sports growing up, but hockey you have to see it in person to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of those things where I don't know if it, I don't know, unless you're a huge fan, I don't think it translates great on TV. For some reason, it, it's hard to get a casual person to sit and watch a hockey game. And I say to this day, playoff hockey is the best sport of all. Like playoff hockey, there's nothing better. Um, you know, so when I try to, when in the past, when I try to introduce someone to the game, I wait to the playoffs. And, you know, you try to get them hooked that way because it's hard not to get into – it's like soccer with the World Cup. I personally can't watch soccer, but the World Cup, it's different. So it's it's a lot like that with hockey. So, but, yeah, I mean, to be there live and to experience it and to and then once you get to try it, you know, even I started with street hockey, obviously. I mean, once you get into it like that, it's hard to it's hard to get rid of it. It's, it, it becomes very addictive. Right, and one of the things that – I really connected with you too was in the documentary talked about how you were in high school and you actually got hurt and that's why you couldn't keep playing anymore. And I found, and that related to me because when I played in middle school, and early high school, I had a couple of concussions and I had to stop playing. So I really thought it was interesting because you kind of went through that period. And I think a lot of athletes can relate where you can't play something you love anymore and you really get down and you really get down yourself. And for you, like, I just loved how you were open about that saying like, man, like I was really in a tough place because I couldn't do the thing I loved anymore because of a physical injury. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it's devastating. You know I mean? I'm look, was I projected to go to the NHL? No way, but you know, I, I love the game. Um, I was hoping to maybe try to walk on out of college somewhere, so, you know, possibly, you know, you try, but um, yeah, I mean, injuries are tough, especially when it's something, you, you know, like anything in life when you don't control it, like I didn't try to get hurt, you know, obviously. So it's tough when it just happens and, and you really have, there's nothing you could do about it. And, you know, the doctor tells you something and, you know, that's, that's all she wrote. And uh, it, it was, it was devastating. It was very, very tough. It was, it was tough to, um, you know, had that injury for sure but then you got a second chance with the game and like I want you to describe to people like what happened today like you're in high school and people are coming up to you congratulating you're going like what the heck did I do <laughs> well yeah it, it's so weird because um it, it basically started a week before that incident when you know it was it was a Sunday and uh you know my dad was like you know, we were eating and he was just like, uh, hey, listen, I'm going to start a team. And you're going to be the president. You know, and again, I thought my dad was playing around with me. You know what I mean? I thought it was like, a, you know, he was playing a game with me. So I you know, was playing with him back in a way. I was like, yeah, sure, dad, I'll do it. Yeah, no, no problem. OK, great. 
And then like a week later or so, you know, maybe 10 days later, you know, like you said, I'm in school and, you know, you walk around, you see people looking at you and you feel it. And I'm just like, the hell, you know, it, it was strange. And then sure enough, um, it was my science teacher at the time came up to me. He was like, oh, my God, this is insane. Uh, you know, and I was just like, what? what are you talking about? And I went to the library. They had those big wooden sticks with the newspaper on it. And uh, I saw it. And, and um, it was weird because, you know, we joked about it. Me and my dad, at least I thought it was a joke, but he didn't like say, OK, like uh, it's going to be in the paper in a week or so. And then it, it was just like totally like such a surreal moment i was just like i was freaking out it was it was crazy yeah and i just remember too like one of the things like you you had that opening press conference and you know a lot of the media was very negative because they're like they're putting a 17 18 year old in charge of a team but did that fuel you because people were doubting your ability and basically saying oh this is ridiculous this will never work oh one million percent. And, and you know, you know what it is, man, is, uh, you know, I get a lot of credit and, and I appreciate the, the, you know, the accolades, but we've had a great team around me and my father. I mean, it was a big collective effort. And uh, but no, on a personal level, of course, because I knew that the minute it came out that my dad was doing this and, you know, it's like giving the kid the keys to the Ferrari. Like I knew I was going to get a lot of, you know, skeptic a lot of skeptics out there, a lot of criticism. And definitely, I was like, you know what, we got to figure a way to, to make it work, you know, by, by any means necessary, we have to, we have to figure this thing out. And um, we just went to work. But I think one of the most important things that I think you understood, which many people don't, especially in minor league sports is you understood the entertainment part of the business more than other people they're just trying to put a team together to compete you're and you had the idea like you had the image in your head of what you wanted to build and the staff around you had the you know you had the foresight to see what you wanted to build so when you're like okay this is what I want for a team this is what I'm imagining go through the process of then being like okay this is what I want but how am I going to get these players to come and play for me yeah, I mean, uh, again, it was one of those things where, you know, me and my dad would talk and, and, you know, one of the biggest things to him is, you know, look, we have to create something here because hockey's not a hotbed in Danbury at the time. You know what I mean? It's, it's kind of like, OK, like what's going to draw people in? You know, you may get people the first weekend because that that curiosity factor. Right. Well, what's going to keep them there? You know, because the novelty wears off quick, no matter what it is in life. So, you know, again, I, uh, to this day, huge wrestling fan. And I, you know, we, I always loved the bad guy. And I said it in the documentary, I, I always, especially in wrestling, like I always seem to root for the heel, you know, because that's, that's who everyone was going against. And, you know, he may not have won every fight or match, but he made an impact and people wanted to see him win, lose, draw, it didn't matter. They wanted to, something about the bad guy drew people in. So we said, look, this is, let's run with that. You know what I mean? And, and we kind of, I mean, we, we self-proclaimed ourselves before the season even started the bad boys of hockey. And that kind of like, that takes a lot of gall to begin with before you even play a game to like nickname yourself. I mean, I think that right there set the tone. And, um, you know, we, we found players that, that, fit the image and bought into the image. You know, it's one thing to find someone that'll fit the image, but you almost pitch it to them. Like, Hey, you know, you got to pitch it to a guy like, Hey, we want you to come to Danbury for this team, the generic contract talk stuff. But also you, these guys weren't used to hearing us, you know, maybe an ownership group talk about, well, this is the image we want for the team. This is what we're thinking about. You know, that level of play, it's pro hockey. It's it's a step and a half below the NHL. But that that level of play, there aren't discussions like that, really. You know, especially in the sport of hockey. Hockey's a real purist sport, too. So I, it definitely ruffled feathers. But um, you found guys, and you could tell by talking to them, you could see with their eyes, like, oh, I, I, I kind of see what, what you want to do. And um, you start you start mapping it out with guys. And, and 
if they buy into it, it it's magical. Right. And like you could tell the guys really did buy in because how many of those meetings have they gone to before? Because a lot of these guys, they play Miley hockey for years and they get the same spiel. Oh, you know, we want to put, you know, a competitive team on the ice. We want to compete. We want to be good. And you're like, we're not going to compete. We're going to kick some, you know what? And we're also going to take names because we're going to be this bad boy image. Like if you want to be rough, go for it. We're not going to restrict you at all. Just be yourself. And for a player, I think they're like, all right, I can buy into this where it's not just someone in a suit just BSing them at the negotiation table. Well, that's exactly it. We weren't really cookie cutter. You know what I mean? I think it's funny. Whenever we met someone, those, especially the first year, but those two years, when you meet someone for the first time or they come, whether it's a player or an employee, when they see like, you know, myself at the time as a kid or my father, they're like not, they don't know what to expect. They, they're coming. They're thinking they're going to an NHL board meeting, right? And then we're sitting there. And it's kind of like they all have the same face. Like They look at you. They don't know what to say. They're like, you can see the wheels turning in their head. Like, what the hell is going? Like, what? who are these people? Like, what? This is who's running the ship. And uh, I think when that initial, like, uh, that, uh, that initial shock factor wore off, I think when people really got down to the, the nooks of what we were looking to do i think they bought i think the majority of people we've ever dealt with i would say 95 percent of them you know they bought in right well one of the favorite things too just listening to you over the past couple of weeks since the document came out is it's fascinating because i feel like there should be like a sequel documentary because there's so many other stories that have come out about this team and one of my favorite ones came from Gary Bettman, where you were talking about him with the Atlanta Thrashers. Did they actually, did he call you or did he meet you in person to basically say, hey, uh, your name's a little too close to one of our NHL brands? I think, so I'll tell you the story, but I think what happened was, you know, during that lockout year, you know, the NHL had a lot bigger things to worry about. But I think what happened was, I, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this the past few months, I think what planted the seed with the NHL was when the Toronto star, which is like the USA today of up there, you know what I mean? They came out with a front page article about how we were basically a disgrace to, to hockey. So I think that probably, I mean, I don't think Gary Bettman was worrying about the Danbury trashers in the UHL during a lockout year. But I think when that headline went out again, no social media back then, I think that went like newspaper viral, maybe, you know what I'm saying? And uh, so, yeah, going into the second year where it was, you know, the summer, me and my father, I'll never forget it. We were in his office. We were talking. And not even necessarily about the team. We were just talking, I think. And Phil Jubileo, our, our PR guy and our, our you know, our, our commentator came in and he said, uh, Jimmy, AJ, I said, he goes, I don't know how you guys are going to take this, but this just came through on fat in the facts. And, you know, he handed it to us, you know, has the NHL seal at the top and, you know, uh, you know, in very legal, legal terms, in layman's terms, I'll explain, you know, basically what they were saying was, hey, you know, we want you to change your name. Um, I took it as you're an embarrassment to hockey. One of our club teams is the Thrashers. We don't want any association with the Thrashers. We don't want people confused. You know, that's how I took it. And, and. We, me and my dad looked at each other like, Jesus, like it's been one year and, and already like, like so we, we thought about it and, uh, you know, you know, me and my dad were talking, we're like, what are we going to do about this? You know, how are we going to respond? And um, basically what ended up, you know, <laughs> through the, through the mind, tr you know, the brain trust at that, that, that office that day was we say, Hey, listen, this is what we do. We wrote it. We, we had Phil write it back in like, proper terms and grammar and everything. And we basically said in so many words, listen, sure, we'll change the name, but this is what we'll do. We're going to fly. We're, we're going to, we're going to fly the Atlanta franchise over to Danbury. We'll have an exhibition in, in late summer or early fall before the season starts. You guys need all the good press that you can do. You guys need attention right now because you just had a season long lockout, which is an embarrassment. I said, what we'll do is we'll bring you guys in. We'll pay room, board, the whole nine yards. And we'll we'll play you for the name. I said, we'll put our team out. You put the Atlanta team out. 
and, uh, you know, count that as one of their preseason games, if you want, you know what I mean? And uh, you know what? We'll play. If you, if, if Atlanta wins, we'll change the name. If we win, we keep the name. And uh, look, we were going to, we would have lost that game, but here's the, here's the problem. To try to take this to court, the NHL prints money. So if we were going to try to fight this in court, we were going to lose. Um, just on the strength of they could have bled us to death, you know, financially, right? So we're like, look, let's challenge them. What's the worst that could happen? They actually take the challenge and then beat us, and we have to change the name anyway. Who cares? But at least we can go down swinging, you know, literally and figuratively. And uh, we sent the fax. We, you know, back in those days with faxes, the, the confirmation came. They look, I'm not saying it crossed Gary Bettman's desk, but someone in that main office got it. And they probably looked at each other like, oh, my God, these guys are insane. But we were serious. My dad was dead serious. He's like, no, we'll fly him in. We'll put him up at the, you know, there's a hotel by the rink. And let's just challenge him. And, you know, nothing nothing came of it, obviously. But, uh, you know, it's it's uh, that's a very, very true story. But like, I think that's also helped you in your career now where you basically – one of the things I admire about you and the group was you're innovative. Like you're always thinking like 10, 15 steps ahead. I mean, you were bringing in players that were in the NHL lockout. So you guys were very forward thinking, which I think also really led to the success you had in promoting this team to be on the ice. And it's funny. I actually think if you were playing now with social media, and if social media was back then, I think the trash would have been even, even bigger. It was just harder because there was no, no social media to get the word out. You put that out now, oh, my God, I feel like everyone would be wanting all these trashers jerseys and trashers apparel. Yeah, I mean, I think about that all. And, you know, even before the Netflix documentary, people would ask me that all the time. Like, say the trashers were playing now with social media, YouTube, Instagram, you know, Facebook, you know, Twitter. And, you know, part of me agrees with you a thousand percent. But also part of me thinks the legend of the trashers itself, it's almost better that we didn't have social media. And the reason I say that is right now, the story of the trashers is now international. Um, I don't know how many people have actually watched it, but it's it's touched a lot of different countries. There is literally only a, a, a small handful of people that can actually say they went to a game live. There's a small and there's like a pride factor there now. I mean, there's fans that tell me, hey, you know, I feel so happy. I was I had season tickets those years like people are trying to buy like <laughs> trasher receipts for like season tickets. Now, I mean, it's 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 insanity how popular the team has gotten. If the if the team was playing now with, with so much access and people's attention spans are so short, you know, would it fizzle out in a month after they got bored with seeing the same thing going viral? I don't know. I mean, I think um, it, I, I could go both ways on it, but I tell you, I think um, I think for the legend of the trashers, the story itself, I think it's perfect because there's not too many recordings. Whatever is recorded is really grainy and it's old school. And I think it adds to the lure. And I think people, you know, I think we live in a day today where, there's so much fake stuff out there. I mean, even some of the funny videos you see on Instagram are fake. You can tell it's planned, but we were so organic and authentic that I think authenticity will always, you know, stand the test of time. And I think that's what's happening with this story. I think people are realizing, wow, these guys were legitimately nuts. They didn't, they weren't trying to be funny. Like they just were doing things and we weren't trying to go viral. We weren't trying to hit a million, you know, likes, you know, we just were doing things. And, uh, I think it's a refreshing story for people, you know, living, you know, the times we're living today. Right. And I completely agree with you because like, I feel, I feel a lot of people like me, the first thing after you saw this documentary is like, okay, I got to look up this video and you're right. It's very difficult. And that adds to the alert. Cause you're like, man, I wish I could have seen that, but you also yeah. talk about going viral. And uh, you know, one of the things about the story is it's transcended sports because you know, Drake just happened to get a Galante jersey and just went viral. Like, I just remember going on Instagram and seeing that. And I'm just like, <laughs> I can't believe Drake is wearing a Danbury Trashers jersey. Like, can you just tell us, like, how that came about? Because it's just amazing to see, like, how this documentary went from just being a 
video that was great video and great documentary on Netflix. So all of a sudden it transcends Netflix and becomes part of pop culture. Um, you know, so the, the documentary premiered uh, the, the 31st of August was a Tuesday and, and the very next day, Wednesday, I'm, I'm literally sitting on the same couch that we're speaking on. And uh, I'm, I'm going through some emails, doing some work and, and I got a notification and, I'm, you know, it's, I'm starting to get a lot of follows on our Instagram, the Trashers Instagram, obviously, because there's Doc. But all of a sudden, like, I see that he's following the, the, the Trasher page. And I'm like, that's weird. I said, um, there's no way that's him, but that's weird. Then he followed um, my boxing gyms page and that was super weird too. And I was just like, so sure enough, you know, uh, the curiosity was killing me. So I just, you know, I reached out and um, long story short, we, we ended up communicating. Um, and he said to me, Hey, listen, you know, I got an album coming out this week. I, I I'm going, I'm going to a premiere. I, I would love to have the Jersey do what do you have and i'm like thinking to myself like oh god this i don't have jersey stockpiled so it's kind of like damn i don't have anything for this guy i'm like this is this is like a once in a billion opportunity and then it hit me that the first ever trash jersey ever made the prototype was they they use my name and the number 17 which was you know the age i was when we started the team and also it was legitimately my hockey number in high school so I went to my office, I broke the frame that it was in, and I took the jersey out. And um, I had someone I know, a friend of mine, drive it up to Buffalo, New York. He sent somebody from uh, Canada down to meet him. The jersey was exchanged, and, and that, you know, I figured, oh, I don't know, maybe he's going to wear it or something, or, you know, send me a, I said, well, look, send me a picture at least, you know. And sure enough, that Saturday morning, like two in the morning, my, my phone starts vibrating like it almost fell off the table. It was vibrating so much. And I was like, I was nervous. I'm like, well, why? What? It's two in the morning. Like, what's going on? And I look and, and, and people are sending me the post and he posted it, what, three times, I think. And I was just like, this is insane. I mean, it was such a proud moment to see like one of the biggest love him. Don't love him. I mean, he's one of the biggest names in the world and he's wearing a Danbury trasher Jersey. It was the funniest. It, I, I started dying laughing. I'm like, this is crazy. And uh, you know, like, like I said earlier, it's, it's a gift and a curse because now I can't produce the jerseys fast enough. And people just want this Jersey now. And uh, it's so humbling because it's, it's like, it's going to be people potentially all over the world wearing this Jersey that frankly, I didn't think would, you know, anyone outside the tri-state would ever, you know, ever know about possibly, you know what I mean? Yeah, but like, that's, that has to be crazy because I'm guessing like it was the first couple of days before the Drake post, it was, you were getting some attention, people were reaching out, but then the second that happens, just because he's not only a huge star in the music industry, but he really also transcends the sports industry as well it probably just was just like almost overwhelming. You're like, look, I'm trying to get all this gear out. And then on top of that, you're probably also worried about people doing copyright, like illegal yeah. jerseys too, to try to make a name off of this as well. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I mean, even now I'm, I'm, you know, I enjoy talking to you, but I could fall asleep. I'm so tired. I've been up, I've been up the past two weeks every day, answering emails and this and that. And, you know, my eyes have been heavy, but uh, no, you know what? it's a, it's a, it's a good problem to have. It's a flattering problem to have. And, and we're working on it, obviously, as we speak. And, um, but yeah, I mean, we, we have the, the logo trademarked again, obviously we've seen some knockoffs and stuff and we're, we do our best to police it as much as you can, but uh, you know what, you, you can't stop it all sometimes, you know, so, you know, nowadays things can go out so quick before you even get tipped off on it. It's already sold. So you know, hey, God bless them. If they could get it out there, you can't knock the hustle. So God bless them. But uh, yeah, we, we try our best to police it. But, uh, you know, it's um, it, it's like I said, I keep using the word, but it's just very it's the whole thing is so humbling to me. I bet there was a lot of stuff that hit the cutting room floor. Was there a story that happened at one of these games? Like, I mean, we saw the John Cena game. We saw the revenge game. Was there a story that you wish got in the documentary, like some crazy thing that happened at a game that you're like, man, if people only knew like this had happened, was there like one of those stories that you wish it was in the documentary 
that actually happen at a game? <clears throat> well, you're right. You know, look, I know, I know for the fact the producers, the Way brothers who did all five of the untold docs, they, we were the longest one out of all five. Um, you know, the producers were really pushing Netflix to let them extend it, extend it. There's so much more. And Netflix wanted every doc to be at around an hour and seven minutes, they told me. Ours was an hour and 25. So they fought hard enough to get that extra 15 minutes or so. But I don't know. You know, the, like I said, it, it's so crazy. As, as many times as I told these stories and, and uh, you know, the legend about the team, I really have to think of it. There's so many layers. There's so many characters. And I mean, each character, there's like 20 different, you know, instances with them. I mean, I don't know if there's a, an actual event off the top of my head I could think of that I wish made it. But, you know, I think the tough thing is with something like this, you kind of want all the players to like get it. You know, I, I feel indebted to all the players that, you know, took a shot to come to our team. And, you know, it's hard because you can't have everyone, obviously. You know what I mean? And then, you know, there's fans that wish they could have saw this one or that one. It, it's tough. You can only, you know, do a documentary. You can't have too many people, obviously. So I wouldn't say there was a moment that we that wasn't included. Just more or less, you know, if it was a longer enough time or multiple multiple uh, chapters or episodes, you know, it would have been great to see some of the other guys in there as well. But, you know, I totally understand. I mean, it was, you know, there's only so much you can, you could tell in an, under an hour and a half. So it's maybe we get the Trasher fans to uh, go on social media and like release the Trasher cut, like the full version, like the two hour documentary. Hey, that's, not a, that's not a bad idea. I mean, uh, hopefully, I mean, the doc's only been out about two, two weeks and change. I mean, I'm waiting for it to die down, but it, it hasn't, it hasn't seemed to, you know, so hopefully it'll just, you know, keep, keep building. You never know. But it's because you got, you have so many likable people and crazy people that you just fall in love with. And like I said, like you, you said the documentary was the longest in that series, but personally watching it, I've watched all five. It felt like the shortest because I was so engaged and every time you're thinking, Oh, they're going to let up a little bit, like something else comes out of nowhere. You're like, this is unbelievable. But I think yeah. what a lot of people feel bad about is you talked about it. You went after the second season, you went to the UHL final, you lost in that game, and then it ended. But one thing I've always wanted to ask you about was going in, if you were to go into that third season, what was the plan? Because one of the things I know about you, just listening to you talking here and on the documentary, you already were thinking ahead, like you already had like a plan that eight. So what was that plan going to the third season to get that championship? I had already mapped out like during the playoffs, you know, um, you know, so here's the thing. So when you're in that league, you could only have active roster, eight quote unquote veterans, they call it anyone who's played. I want to say a hundred or 150 pro games collectively that's considered a veteran. So you can only have so many veterans on your active roster. You had, there was a minimum of like three to five rookies you had to have. I already had the rookies like targeted. Um, I had some of the veterans we wanted. Um, honestly, it's almost in a way a blessing we didn't have a third year because we kept trying to top ourselves with some of the craziness. And we were getting to that point of how much crazy are we going to get into the point where they just shut us down? Like, like, you know, totally, you know what I mean? So it was one of those situations where I'm disappointed. We didn't win at all. I really believe if there was a third year, we probably would have been the favorites to win it all. And I would have loved to win it all. But in a sense, with some of the other stuff, the other side to the team and the, the flip side, it's probably better we didn't. Because for us to keep trying to outdo ourselves, it was getting, it was some of the ideas floating around. It was getting a little, it was going to get a little crazy. Oh, there, can you give us like one of those crazy ideas that was floating around maybe? <laughs> one of those ideas I can tell you was, and this goes back to my love for pro wrestling. One of my ideas was <laughs> I was going to stage during a game, depending on who was on our rival teams, you know, Adirondack and Elmira were our two closest rivals, Adirondack mostly. There was a certain player on Adirondack that if he came back for the, 
that next season, the third season, I was literally, I, I kid you not, I was literally going to pull like a WWF promo, have like a wireless mic, and from the box, you know, call this guy out. And I was actually going to skate in the next game, you know, we played them. I was going to, I was going to just skate a game. We were going to ramp it up like a promo, like, like AJ skating. And it got it. It probably would have ended somewhat badly for me, but it would have been a, an all out brawl. But I was willing, you know, I was going to basically get one game in and just stir it up. But that, that was an idea that we floated. Could the commissioner put the kibosh on it? Probably. Well, we looked into that. What can he make us do, not make us do? And I think there was <laughs> there was wiggle room there. So I think we were going to be able to pull it off. Um, it would have been absolutely insanity if, if that happened. But that was, that was I could tell you right there, that was definitely floated around. <laughs> I can only imagine what the 102 would have done in that game. That would have oh, been. Man, yeah. Well, that's why I never would have to worry because those, th- those guys and girls, they, they, I knew they had our back. So, but uh, yeah, it would have, um, <laughs> I, I know for a fact that was, that was floated around. Yeah. I, Cause like you always like, like you said, like you had so many great ideas. You saw all the great promos that you did that, but it was more about the product on the ice than anything about getting people into the game. But to me, when I watch the documentary, I think so many people focus on the craziness. They focus on the trashers. But to me, my favorite part of the documentary was actually you and seeing you grow from a young kid to a te- a kid at 17 getting a t- kid, uh, I mean, getting a team. And then you end up at the end, you go through a tough time when the trasher is full, but then you are able to pick yourself up. Do you think that this is something you want to show kids at your gym or do you use this story to help saying, look, this is like boxing. There's going to be times you get knocked down. You're going to get your teeth knocked in a couple of occasions. But the big thing is just keep getting up and keep going forward. You know, I never looked at it that way, to be honest with you. And, and it's funny because so many of the kids in my gym weren't even alive during the trash wars. So, you know, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm a humble guy. I haven't walked around all these years and be like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm not like that 40 year old who still wears his varsity jacket to the bar. You know what I mean? I don't go around being like, Hey, I, 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 I ran the team. I ran the so these kids up until two weeks ago, a lot of them had no idea who the trashers were. They weren't even alive. And when this thing came out, these kids would see me in the gym after. First of all, they'd be clowning me the way I dressed and stuff when I was young. And I'm like, hey, listen, it was a different time. All right, relax. But uh, they would, they, they are just like, this is crazy. Like, like, that's how you were back then. I'm like, it's like, it was a different time. I said, I was young. I said, but you know, you know, I'm going to use that analogy. I'll give you the credit for that one, you know, but it's true. You know, you, you, you try to show them that, that and it's good for them to see, because they see me a certain way in the gym and I, you know, I can be very serious at times, but I wasn't always like that. So I like them to see, like, you know, I, I feel like they've been relating to me, you know, they're seeing me as a 17 year old now and uh, not so much, you know, the guy that runs the gym at, you know, mid thirties. So it's kind of like, in a way, it, it, I'm happy it's happened because I've always been connected to a lot of these kids, but now it feels like they they see it. Look, it's a very vulnerable thing, you know, to put a story out there about yourself on this type of platform, especially, you know, home videos and, you know, things. It, it's 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 kind of weird to see it. And, uh, you know, it's it's a vulnerable thing. But, you know, like I never thought of that analogy you just gave. So I, it's so great to hear people what they've taken, you know, what they took from this doc and how they could relate it. And that's what it's about. If people could learn from it, um, that's the main thing. Right. And I think it was important for kids to see because you you went through a lot and especially with your father and you can see how great a relationship you have with your father. But there was times where he couldn't be in your life. And I bet that that's something you can relate to some of these kids who might not have a parent in their life and just be like, look, it's tough, but you're, you'll get through it. Like I was able to get through it. It was very difficult, but you can get through. And I think that's one of the great things about this documentary too, is like really it focused on you and your family 
and the strong family dynamic that you had. And I think that not a lot of people like to talk about that because everyone wants to talk about, oh, the trashers, they're all the crazy stories. Yeah. But to me, I think that's why this resonates is because there's great heart behind it. And especially, I think the heart of this documentary is your family, your growth, and really the connection that you have with your father. No, and, and that, that means a lot, you know, and, and again, it, it's, it's one of those things where you're right. There's so many, I've, I've had to watch it myself three, four times. And I don't think I've digested it. You know what I mean? Cause the, the first time you're watching it, I feel like I'm floating. Like, I can't believe I'm watching this right now. And, and you know, I've had to watch it a few times to try to digest the whole thing. But um, yeah, I mean, there's so many layers, like you said, and, and uh, that's the most important thing is, is family, you know, and family doesn't necessarily have to be blood. You know, I try to tell these kids, look, okay, maybe you don't have a large family in terms of, you know, blood relatives, but family, when you get older, half the time who you consider your family isn't, isn't, you know, uh, blood relatives. You know what I'm trying to say? So I tell these guys, like you, you surround yourself with positive people, you know, positive people in your life. And, um, as you get older, you'll know who your real family is. And, and, and it's true. I mean, um, I'm blessed enough to have, you know, a family where I, I am close to my blood relatives, you know? So I've been lucky in that aspect that, that I have that relationship too, to this day, like you said, they very, very lucky. But it also feels like the trashers are family because they, you can tell like how much they care about. This wasn't just a job for them. For so many athletes, it's just the job. It's just the team. But this really felt like a family. And one of the things I think everyone wants to know, we've seen the fan reunion. When is the trash your team reunion? I mean, I think everyone <laughs> needs to see that. Well, I tell you, I, I, I joked with my dad, you know, you know, it's funny, like the countdown, like six months leading up to the doc, it, it started becoming a little real. Like, oh my God, this is actually coming out. This is actually happening. And, you know, Every day was a roller coaster, like, you know, say it flops, say it doesn't do good, say people don't like it. And then there's times where like this story's too good. It's gonna do great. You go back and forth to see who's gonna like it, who's not. And I always joked, I said, Hey dad, you know, listen, th this documentary last year, the Tiger King, you know, it became insane. I said, I'm not saying it's gonna grow as big as that, but if it got big enough, you know, maybe instead of Comic Con, you do Trasher Con, you know what I mean? And and uh we try to figure a way to bring some of these guys, you know, back to the Danbury and um, you never know. I mean, you just, you just, at this point, I wake up every day, wherever the wind takes me, I, I there's no plans right now for it, but I would not be shocked if, uh, if that doesn't happen. We've seen you promote though. I, I think that this would be an easy sell, like a pickup game or an outdoor game in Danbury, you know, get the team to get like make split up the squads you know i just think it'd be a lot of fun and i think it'd be i think you'd get a lot of people not just the diehard trasher fans but just there's so many characters because this is like a reality show because it actually is real life for people and i think a lot of people in the, especially the tri-state area would be like wait a minute i could actually go and meet these people like they're not just yeah. characters on a netflix show i think it could really resonate with people and be a lot of fun no, I mean, I would definitely be open to it. Like I said, you just never, never know. And I, I mean, the support we've gotten internationally has been crazy to me. I mean, I'm getting messages, you know, obviously Canada, forget it. I, I probably get more messages from Canada, but I mean, England, you, you know, Australia, I mean, from all over. And it's just like, it, it's crazy. And because of all the different time zones, I mean, I'm getting my, my phone's going off literally 24 seven right now because people are reaching out and, uh, you know, I always reach out back, you know what I mean? I, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm paying for it because I'm exhausted right now, but you know, I always feel an obligation to, you know, if someone reaches out and, and shows any sort of support, you know, I, I feel I owe it to them to, you know, respond and, and be like, hey, you know, I, I, I see what you said and thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today, AJ. Can't wait to see what's the next chapter in your life. I mean, this is something that I'm definitely going to keep an eye on and definitely want to hear and see, especially what you do next. Because like I said, you're a great promoter. I know you got a lot up there in your head that you're thinking of, not just for the gym, but you're definitely going to promote something really great. I can't wait to see what it is. 
Thank you. I hope to see you there, whatever, whatever we end up doing. I'll, I'll be there. I'll be there. Thank you so much. <laughs>